So uh, let's get right into it this morning. Uh, last week, I, I began a series in the book of Colossians. And the book of Colossians, just as a way of review, is a letter written by the apostle to a church in the city of Coloss, say. Uh, it was led by a man named Epaphras, who was a disciple of the Apostle Paul. Uh, he had heard the gospel on one of Paul's missionary journeys, and his life was dramatically changed by the love of Christ. So then he went back home, and he started spreading the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Souls were saved, and eventually a new church formed. A new church was planted right there in that seemingly insignificant city. The church began to grow and new life in Christ began to be evident. Lives were being transformed um, and yet Epaphras had an intense burden because he saw some trouble creeping in. He was concerned that false teaching had crept into the church. He was distressed by these false teachers. He was shaken to his core because some believers in the church were being led astray. Instead of continuing to do the work of outreach and evangelism and discipleship, some in the church were spending all their time arguing philosophy while sitting under false teachers who taught that salvation comes through Christ, but also through your works. This was a crucial situation to Epaphras, and so he made his way to Rome, where the Apostle Paul was sitting in prison to get advice on how to drive these false teachers, these vicious wolves, out of the fellowship. Paul's response is this letter that we're going through. The theme of this book uh, of the Bible is new life in Christ. Paul could clearly see the dangerous situation that the Colossian church was in. And so, as an apostle of Jesus Christ, called by the will of God, he wanted to provide some encouragement, but also some guidance, and then also some loving correction. But first, uh, as we saw last week, before he got into any of that, Paul celebrated their new life in Christ. Paul celebrated that a new family of God was formed in this city. Next week, we'll see how Paul exalted Christ on high, uh, exalts Christ on high. But this week, um, we're going to look at Paul's prayers, Paul's power-packed prayers for this church. So if you would turn your Bibles to Colossians chapter 1, we're going to be in verse 9 through 14 this morning. And if you can stand for the reading of the word. Colossians 1, 9 through 14. The Word of God says, And so, from the day we heard, we have not ceased to pray for you, asking that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will and all spiritual wisdom and understanding, so as to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him, bearing fruit in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God being strengthened with all power according to his glorious might, for all endurance and patience with joy, giving thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. He has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of his beloved Son in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. Heavenly Father, Lord, we come before you and Lord, we recognize your goodness, we recognize your grace, we so full of gratitude for you. And, and Father, I ask that you would use me. Um, your, your word says that your strength is perfected in weakness. And I believe you have something for someone today. So help me to decrease that you would increase that someone would be encouraged a little bit cha uh, change as they walk out of here. Father, have your way this morning. In Christ's name, amen. So the power of prayer is one of the most mysterious yet powerful truths in the entire Bible. The concept of Prayer is almost beyond our comprehension when we think about how powerful our God is. We serve an a omnipotent, an all-powerful God who is sovereign, who is in control at all times. God is omniscient, meaning that he knows all there is to know. He knows the end from the beginning. The book of Isaiah expands on his greatness when it says, it is he who sits above the circle of the earth and, and its inhabitants are like grasshoppers. Uh, what a picture that is. God is all this and more, yet for some reason, God still designed our prayers, our 
feeble prayers to make a difference in how he intervenes in the lives of people. For some reason, God has chosen to use his Holy Spirit living inside of us to give us the urge to intercede for people. Sometimes we don't pay attention to this urge. Sometimes we ignore the whispers of the Spirit. But once you begin to act in obedience to the whispers, the the, the urge to pray for people, uh, according to the Holy Spirit's guidance, powerful things begin to happen. One of the most amazing examples of this in my life occurred about four years ago while I was unloading a U-Haul here in Jessup as we were moving in. It was literally when I was carrying a box of books in my hand that I suddenly had the urge to pray for a friend of mine whose wife was nine months pregnant. I didn't know that anything was happening, but I had the sudden urge to pray for her health and for the health of the baby. I dropped a box of books and did just that. I began to pray to intercede for their safety when within a few minutes, my friend called me from Phoenix, Arizona and frantically asked me to pray for his wife and baby because she had had a sudden abruption where she lost tons of blood and her life and the baby's life was in jeopardy. I told him and encouraged him that the Spirit had already told me that something was going on and that I was praying for him, giving him some confidence that God was in control. Long story short, a miracle happened. The doctors even had to admit that a miracle took place because of the lack of uh, the amount of blood they lost. Uh, that the mom and the baby survived, and not just survived, but are and was completely healthy. Family, you can never convince me that God doesn't answer our prayers. Prayer is powerful, not because we're great, but because God is great. Prayer is powerful because we serve a powerful God who chooses to use our prayers and chooses to respond to our prayers in powerful ways. Here in the text this morning, we see an example of another power-packed prayer, of intercessory prayer, of the urge to pray. For the Apostle Paul had been offering his unceasing prayers for this church ever since he heard of their new life in Christ. Paul had known the obstacles and the temptations that the Colossians were enduring, probably more than any other Christian that's ever lived. Paul knew that Satan, the author of confusion, hates Christians with a passion. Paul knew that even though Satan cannot snatch away the eternal life of someone truly saved by Christ, Paul knew that Satan is and was still able to disrupt, to deceive, to discourage, and to divide. So even before Paul exalts Christ and offers theological correction, he first says, I am praying for you. I am praying for you. In the scriptures today here, we see these prayers are packed with power. For Paul knew the times, just as they are, times are difficult today. I I believe it would do us well to walk through these prayers and then apply them to our our own lives. For point number one in this power-packed prayer this morning is that Paul prays that we would know God's will. He could have prayed for anything but he prayed that we would know God's will. Verse 9 says, And so from the day we heard, we have not ceased to pray for you, asking that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will. The knowledge of his will. That's what his first prayer was, that we would know the knowledge of his will. Now this knowledge that Paul is referring to is not a surface knowledge of, oh, I know God, I know of the Bible. No, Paul wanted these believers to have, to be filled are completely controlled by God's will for our lives. This is a knowledge that, uh, of God's will that goes beyond the surface and into a deep knowledge of what God desires for each and every one of us. Yet the disturbing part about searching for God's will in our lives is that, like the Colossians, we too are tempted to think of God's will as being something that has to be discovered outside of his word. Often we act like a tourist on a beach somewhere with a metal detector, spending hours scouring the beach for a treasure only to find 
old soda cans or something like that. You see, uh, uh, as a side point here this morning, you may want to write it down. It's up there on the screen is you need to know that God's will for you is not a secret. God's will is not hidden from you. It's not a treasure you have to find. You don't find God's will through a hyper-spiritual seance with incense and soft music playing in the background. You don't find God's will through some type of weird ceremony, through making an appointment with a palm reader or a psychic, or even through waking up and reading your horoscope. Because all that is really just a spirit of witchcraft created by the devil himself to lead you down a path of destruction. No, God's will is not a secret, and God's will is found in his word. Second Peter 1, 3 tells us his divine power has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us to his own glory and excellence. God has given us everything we need for life and godliness. So let me help you this morning. You may want to write this down. I did put the scripture references on, on the screen, but what is God's will? What do we know God's will is for your life? Well, number one, God's will for you is that you would be saved, that you would have salvation in Christ. First Timothy 2 says, this is good and it is pleasing in the sight of God, our Savior, who desires all people to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. God's will for you and for your life all starts with your salvation that God generously offers through the sacrifice of his son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. Family, our problem is not other people. It's not the environment we live in. Our problem isn't even the wicked world's influence in our life. Our first and our biggest problem we all have is that our sin separated us from a holy God. Therefore, Jesus said, you must be born again. Born again, this spiritual conversion to new life in Christ is the necessary first step to knowing God's will for your life. I find it interesting, especially lately, you know, uh, I've had many people come to me with different problems in their life and, and, and folks that are unbelievers that's never been in church and, and, and uh, uh, they want to talk about a relationship issue or they want to talk about how they hate their job or, or, or something like that. And I'm willing to talk to people about that, but that's not really the problem. I always say, you know, you're, you're grasping at fixing the branches here when really we need to get to the root of the issue. And the root of the issue for an unbeliever is that an unbeliever needs to be saved. The root of the problem, we all have to be reconciled to God. Before anything, God's will, family, is that you would be saved. But then number two, God's will doesn't stop at your salvation. Our salvation is not fire insurance that saves us from hell, but allows us to live however we want. For God's will is also for us to be sanctified. 1 Thessalonians 4, 3 says, For this is the will of God, your sanctification. Sanctification literally means to be set apart by God for his holy purpose. And your sanctification is the process of your daily life, of becoming more like Christ day after day. Day. This is the same t- sometimes painful process of being conformed into the likeness of Jesus Christ. For God didn't just save you so you can go on living how you used to live. No, Ephesians 1 says he chose us in him before the foundations of the world that we should be holy and blameless before him. Family, I know you want to know God's will for your life in terms of who you should marry and what job you should take and what you should do and what decisions you can make to make your life happy. But it's God's will that first you be saved and second that you be sanctified, that you grow to be more like Jesus every day. It's God's will for you to be a little more humble than you were yesterday. It's God's will for you to forgive others a little bit more than you did last week. It's God's will for you to be a little more generous than you were last week. It's God's will for you to be more full of love for people than you were last year. It is God's will that you would grow in Christ. And just like the fiery furnace refines a piece of gold, the fire that you go through in life 
is refining you as well, burning off all the imperfections in your life. And that's why it's painful sometimes. Family, it's God's will that you be sanctified. Number three, it's God's will for you to be spirit-filled, to be filled with the Spirit. Ephesians 5 says, Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is, and do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit. Brothers and sisters, God's will is that the Holy Spirit living on the inside of you would be so overflowing in your life that you immediately recognize the difference between being led by the Spirit and being led by your flesh. God's will is that you would submit to that Spirit living on the inside of you and not our own fleshly wants and desires. For Galatians tells us why we shouldn't live by the flesh. Galatians 5 says, now the works of the flesh are evident. Sexual immorality is included in that. Impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like this. That's the result of being led by your flesh, of being filled with the flesh and not with the spirit. So it's God's will that we would be filled with his spirit. Then it's God's will that we would stand firm in the faith that we have in Christ. First Peter 2 says, for this is the will of God. You see why you don't have to look to the world or look to some uh, uh, fancy ideas and tactics to find the will of God? Because it says it right here. For this is the will of God that by doing good, you should put to silence the ignorance of foolish people. See, God's will is that our lives would be filled with goodness, with good deeds that represent our new heart and mind that we've received in Christ. This means that we are to live opposite of the world. This involves standing up for the truth, which is hard to do these days. This involves contending for the faith. This also involves standing up for those who can't stand up for themselves as James 1 tells us that religion that is pure and undefiled before God the Father is this, to visit orphans, to take care of people that can't take care of themselves, of, uh, of, to take care of widows in their affliction, and to keep oneself unstained from the world. we got to take a stand. That is God's will. That you have to take a stand. But then, and this, you, this one, you won't hear this on most Christian TV these days, But the will of God is also that we would suffer at times. 1 Peter 4 says, Therefore, let those who suffer according to God's will entrust their souls to a faithful creator while doing good. We know that Jesus on the Sermon on the Mount said, Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of God. If Jesus Christ suffered then you know we're going to have to suffer sometimes. We're going to have to go through some trials and tribulations. Uh, Life is not going to be a cakewalk. I know you might uh, see that on Christian TV where uh, if you come to Christ, everything's always perfect, but I got to tell you, that's not true. That's a lie. Family, God's will for you is not secret. And so Paul prayed that we would be filled, liberally supplied, with the knowledge of his will. So you can put away the metal detector you've been using to find the treasure of God's will. You can stop living your life running around like you're in a giant corn maze trying to find the right path because God's will is that you would be saved, that you would be sanctified, that you would be spirit-filled, that you would stand for the faith, and that, yes, you would have to suffer sometimes. But then... Here's the question. You say, oh, okay, I get that. That's God's will. But what happens when you have a real practical decision to make that is not clearly outlined in the Word of God? What should you do when there's not a chapter and verse for the decision that you have to to make. Well, the Bible tells us that we would pray for wisdom and that if we would uh, pray for wisdom, that God would give this to that in a generous way. And so Paul here prays, prayers include asking that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding. 
This is something that you can't just make a five-step plan to, to accomplish. This is spiritual wisdom and understanding that comes from the Holy Spirit to the point where you might have, not have a black or white answer, but you just, know, you just get to the point where I know this is what God is calling me to do. I experienced this uh, uh, when we decided to follow God's call to move from sunny California to ice storms filled in Iowa. I didn't have a black or white answer for that, but I had to pray for spiritual wisdom and understanding. But when you pray for it, God will give that to you, for that is his will that you have all spiritual wisdom and understanding. And discerning God's will in this way takes faith. Because life will often take you to a place where you can't trace what God is doing. You ever been there? You say, I I don't know what God is doing in my life right now. And so sometimes we can't trace God. But when you can't trace God, you have to trust him. I remember praying and begging as I was uh, living with my (laughs) In-laws, <laughs> God, you got to tell me what to do. <laughs> he is faithful, amen? You see, the goal is not to separate yourself from every difficulty and every dilemma that life may bring your way. No, the goal of being filled with the knowledge of God's will with all spiritual understanding is not to please yourself, but to please God. Look at verse 10. It says, as to walk, So as to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to Him, bearing fruit in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. Family, I'm, I'm going to come right into your living room, right into your business right now. Uh, you can blame it on me not feeling good. But here's the question. The question I need you to analyze is not how successful you are, But the question you need to ask yourself this morning is, does my life please God? Family, hear me out. It should be all of our desires to please God. We should wake up in the morning with our mind on pleasing God. We should go to work with our mind on pleasing God. It should be our desire to please God in raising your family and interacting with your spouse. It it should be all of our goal to please God. Paul doubles down on this in Ephesians and says, I therefore, a prisoner of the the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of your calling, to which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love. Oh, you mean I got to bear with someone I don't like? You mean I I just have to be long-suffering when my wife is getting on my nerves? She's not here today, so I can say that. You mean I have to be eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace if I want to please God? Yes, that's what I'm saying. The Scriptures use the word walk, which is a reference to how we live our life, the lifestyle, our daily conduct. But here's the rub. Here's the rub. Our goal is to please God. And so anytime our walk doesn't match up with our talk, then you can be assured that you will always have tension in your life between you and God, and then you and other people. Because here's the thing, if you're a Christian, if you're truly God's child, he will not allow you to be comfortable living a life that is not pleasing to him. The prodigal son went away and spent all the money and and riches, but he was not comfortable. He was living in the pig pen, and he just had to come back to his father. I mean, a lot of people say that they love God, that they love Jesus, and a lot of people say they are Christians, but their walk says something different. And that could be why there's tension in your life. I don't know. I'm not judging. For who cares if you have an intellectual knowledge of God's word if you don't live it out? James again says, be doers of the word, and not only hearers deceiving yourself. And then the second half of verse 10 says, bearing fruit in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. Family, I know that you would love to be blessed with financial security and perfect health and an easy going life, but the greatest blessing we can ever have in life 
is to have an increasing intimate relationship, intimate knowledge of God where you know in the depths of your being, no matter what is going on around you, that, that God in heaven is your father and that you are his child. Remember, Paul was the most accomplished person in the entire Bible, but he said in Philippians 3, he said, but whatever gain I have, I count it as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the suppressing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. Family, that's a power-packed prayer, isn't it? Number two, then Paul prays for spiritual strength and power. Verse 11 says, being strengthened with all power, according to his glorious might, for all endurance and patience with joy. Brothers and sisters, there are many people who profess to be Christians for a while and and show that they are sold out for Jesus for a while. But like an old preacher used to say, some people's faith fizzles far from the finish. This is why Paul is praying for the Colossians' strength. He did not want their faith to fizzle out before the finish line. Jesus speaks of the same thing in the parable of the sower. I won't read the whole thing, but we know that the the sower went out to sow and he started scattering seed along the ground. And we know that some came up and and some were choked out. But uh, later on, he explains that parable. And he says, when anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what has been sown in his heart. And this is what was sown along the path. He says, as for what was sown on rocky ground, this is the one who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy, yet he has no root in himself, but endures for a while. And when tribulation and persecution arises on account of the word, immediately he falls away. You see why Paul is praying for their strength? You see why Paul is praying for their strength and and, and spiritual endurance? He didn't want them to be choked out by the the world's cares. He didn't want the Colossian believers to to turn from Christ because of trials and tribulations. He wanted the root to grow strong so that they can endure whatever is thrown their way. And family, my deepest desire as your pastor is that your faith in Christ would run so deep that nothing would be able to shake it. You see, this is why a prayer for strength according to God's glorious might is such a power-packed prayer. Because here's the thing. You cannot avoid all the storms of life. You can't avoid it. I wish you could, right? Right? But you can't. The storm will come your way. The question is, will your faith in Jesus be strong enough to endure? And will you have the patience required to maintain your joy even when the waves are crashing up against the boat? Verse 11 says, being strengthened with all power according to whose might? Not your might. To his glorious might for all endurance with Joy And this word endurance or steadfastness in some translations refers to the, uh, a man or woman of God who is not shaken or the child of God who does not swerve away from the finishing the goal, the race of faith, even in the midst of great trials or suffering. Patience refers to our Christ-like relationships, even in our relationships with difficult people. My last church, I... I I was fortunate enough to minister to a woman there. Uh, um, Her kids were in my youth group, and I baptized her kids, and she was a wonderful woman of God, still is. Um, She was so committed to the Lord. Her dream was to go on the missions field, and and she was just such a great example, Uh, yet her husband was not a believer. And her husband refused to listen uh, to the gospel. In fact, I remember being called to his bedside after he had a heart attack um, in the first couple years and knowing that family, and I stood next to his bed trying to share him the gospel, and he wanted nothing to do with it. It was so discouraging, but yet we kept praying for his salvation. This woman kept praying for her husband's salvation. She kept trying to be a good example over and over again, and she was. 
uh, when suddenly, um, after about 10 years of knowing or eight years of praying diligently, he was diagnosed with cancer. And this cancer, by the time they found it, had, had spread to all his body. And he was going to be dying soon. And, and, and finally, his heart was opened up to the gospel. And he was saved and he was baptized. And a few weeks later, he died. But I think of this woman's example of how she endured with joy. And her joy was fulfilled in knowing that her husband was going to be with Jesus and is with Jesus. Family, that's an example of we need the strength of God. Guess what I'm trying to tell you is that whether we think about it or not, we all need God. We all need God. We need His strength. We need His power to help us live right. We need God's power to help us think right. We need God's power to keep us in the faith. We need God to help us discern what's right from almost right. We need God to control our tongue uh, so we stop hurting ourselves and other people because we can't control the words we say. We need God to guard us from temptation to give up and go back to our old ways of living. We need God. We need God every hour and every second of the day. We need God. And then, number three, Paul prayed that we would be full of gratitude. Isn't it interesting, out of all the things he could have prayed, he also prayed that we would be full of thanksgiving. Verse 12, look at it. It says, giving thanks to the Father, who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of his saints in light. He says, giving thanks to the Father. Why should we give thanks? We should give thanks with every ounce of our being because God, the Father, initiated an eternal transfer in the life of a Christian. God planned this transfer. Jesus secured this transfer. And the Holy Spirit applied this transfer to our lives. For the Bible says, thanks to the Father who qualified you to share in the inheritance of of the saints in life. Family, gratitude should spring up in our lives every day of our life. Because we were once unqualified and undeserving of receiving any blessing from God. But God has given us our qualifications. What is our qualifications? Our qualifications to receive the inheritance that we have and will receive is only the finished work of Christ on the cross. Jesus won this victory and anyone who has faith in him is hereby declared victorious in him. Jesus won the victory. He conquered sin. He conquered death. He conquered the grave. The gift of faith that we exercise in Jesus gives us our portion of this eternal life. The gift of faith gives us our portion of God's peace and God's kingdom. This eternal transfer also gives us our our deliverance from the domain of darkness into the kingdom of his beloved son. This domain of darkness is where all those who refuse to live, to believe in Christ, live. This domain of darkness is where we all live before coming to Christ. This domain of darkness is under the jurisdiction and the controlling influence of Satan. And that's why there is so much anger. And that's why there is so much confusion. And that's why there's so much wrath in the world today. But through the power of God, we've been transformed out of that realm and into God's kingdom. That's a good time to say amen. We received a transfer from that darkness to light, from a state of hopelessness to a state of joy, uh, uh, of eager anticipation and confident expectation that one day God will make all things new, that one day he'll wipe every tear from your eye, that one day he'll restore everything back to uh, his original creation family. I love Lamentations 3.22 that says, It reminds us that in God's kingdom, the steadfast love of the Lord never ceases, that his mercies never come to an end, and the mercies of God are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. You know, sometimes when you're having a bad day, this tells me you just need to go to sleep (laughs) and wake up in the morning with new mercies. Amen? 
In conclusion this morning, I believe the will of God is for us to be so thankful to God for our salvation that we serve him all the days of our life because we have been redeemed. We have been set free and all of our sins have been forgiven. Verse 14 says it. It says, in him, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of our sins. The word redemption means that we have been purchased out of slavery, specifically slavery to sin. But in order to be redeemed and to be purchased, a ransom had to be paid. Our redemption came at a high cost. The cost of our redemption, the cost of our freedom, was the precious blood of Jesus Christ. That's why I always say, Our salvation is free. Our salvation is free, but it's not cheap. Our salvation cost Jesus his life one Friday 2,000 years ago as the blood of our king came pouring down from the crown of his head to the soles of his feet. As Jesus was led up Calvary's hill to the place of the skull where he was tortured and beaten for our transgressions, for the sins that you and I committed. Our salvation is free, but it's not cheap. It costs Jesus everything. A crown of thorns was designed to mock his kingship, was rammed into his skull. Jesus was hung high and he was stretched wide on a cross. Jesus was beaten so bad that The book of Isaiah says that he was beaten to the point where he was unrecognizable. A spear was pierced in his side as they got a little tired of torturing him. And when they pierced him, he was already dead. Jesus endured total humiliation. Our salvation is free, but it's not cheap. Jesus suffered for six hours receiving the complete wrath of God, and it is for our sake. He made him to be sin, who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Eternal transfer was taking place. Our sin was transferred onto Jesus, and his righteousness was transferred to us. This is the cost of our redemption. Shouldn't we be so thankful that we live a life pleasing to the Lord? The Bible says, as far as the east is from the west, so far as he removed our transgressions, and so you're free. Our salvation is free, but it's not cheap. Shouldn't we thank the Father? Shouldn't we be thankful enough not to slide back into our own ways, not to return to the dead things that we've been delivered out of, For Jesus is sufficient for all you need. I know you want a better job, and and I know you would like more money in the bank, and and I know you wish that your sciatic nerve would stop acting up. But Jesus Christ is sufficient for all you need. The Word of God says, Blessed be the Father, be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to His great mercy, He has caused us to be born again, to a living hope through the resurrection of Christ from the dead. 